All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's really a great pleasure and honor to have such an incredible group of scholars and practitioners um, here today, historians, scientists, lawyers, journalists, writers, architects, landscape architects, artists, urban designers, and planners, as well as real estate development experts come together to share their perspective on the terms of the conference. It's also a moment for us to reflect and also connect remotely to the talks in Paris. On the one hand, climate change, its human and historical causes, its effects on the planet and its future, as well as, as its human significance, as the title of this evening's keynote suggests, which we have the great pleasure of having Professor Deepesh Chakrabarti give for us tonight. And on the other hand, the concept of scales of environment, a combination of terms coined by our faculty member, Kate Orff, to represent the sense of inextricable connectedness of part to whole across time and space, and which we will spend much of today unpacking. How do we draw these two notions together, that of climate change and that of scales of environment, and reframe them to open up new forms of knowledge, of engagement, and of practice that will be our challenge today? The day is quite ambitious in its reach and not easy to introduce, since it doesn't fall along the expected lines of the various debates that have taken place in architecture schools in the past decade. This is in great part thanks to a number of our faculty who is approaching the question from different perspectives and who agreed to come together at my invitation to consider climate change as, quote, ground zero for conversation here at the school. So I wanted to take this moment to thank Jesse Keenan, Laura Kurgan, Reinhold Martin, Kate Orff, and Marcus Suda for collectively constructing the various frames we will use today. Beyond the statistics that we all know, tying climate change to the built environment, it's maybe more important to say that we all have already seen or experienced in one way or another both global urbanization and climate change, the unprecedented, unprecedented uh, speed, the scale, the density of both formal and informal settlements, the overwhelming population migrations, either from rural to urban, from conflict or from both, the housing and infrastructure shortages, and the resource depletion, specifically water and the resulting drought, whether in California or in Syria. As critical urban theorist Neil Brenner suggested in his lecture here two weeks ago, our work must start not in registering urbanization, but in making visible an already entirely urbanized planet, connecting small and large swath of operational landscapes that are enabling what we call cities. And yet, despite the urgency and centrality of the built environment in actively contributing to climate change, architects seem to be caught in a kind of paralysis brought up on postmodern critical soup intended to cure architecture from its social and environmental aspirations through the reenacting of modernists' failures, any attempt to dare to attempt to imagine a better collective future where everyone might be housed and fed is still considered a social engineering heresy, and not entirely without reason. As planner and writer David Sims concluded in our Housing the Majority Symposium last year, reflecting on half a century of failed housing policies in Egypt, housing the majority or letting the majority house itself, he asked. And yet, of course, we know no one is really housing themselves. Nothing just happens. The American suburban sprawl didn't just happen. It was enabled by the Highway Federal Act. The favelas across Latin America aren't just organic, they are strategically unable to produce political agency. The urbanization of China is not only designed, it is enabled by the largest number of planners per country in the world, following old models of Western urban renewal. The development of the New York, Miami, Beirut, Dubai coastline and into luxury condominiums is not just market forces. It is the oeuvre of architects and developers working hand in hand, deeply embedded in the process of capitalization Tim Mitchell articulated for us in the Arab City Conference last year as we discussed Gulf cities. Bigness, 
or the scaling up of everything from bodies to buildings, giving us spectacular museums. The size of cities didn't just happen, it was the manifesto of one particular architect who shaped architecture for the 21st century, making our contemporary iconic buildings the scale of entire medieval cities, and singularly the mobilizing force of enormous resources, labor, and infrastructure. Climate change didn't just happen either, and we're always already engaged. At its most basic, architecture is environment, and buildings are one possible scale of environment. As environment, architecture is the drawing of lines that separate inside from outside, to produce shelter, to create a city, to build a wall, which at once includes and excludes. It is an artificial environment, a second nature that displaces the first one and has even claimed to replace it. As the line is drawn, architecture is a negotiation between inside and outside and between one and the other. It is a frame and a boundary which regulates, measures, and represents this negotiation, a negotiation that has preoccupied architects for centuries. From the social utopias of the early industrial age, such as Fourier's Phalanster, designed to balance the agrarian on the one side and the industrial on the other, to Howard's town country, which tightly bound together the best of the town and the best of the country, to Corb's radiant city, or Kikutake's fish farm city, on the sea, a self-sustaining system designed to house Tokyo's exploding population, and to the recent paradigms of new urbanism, landscape urbanism, or ecological urbanism, one can read the persistence of the boundary, a literal wall, and an operative frame where everything on the inside is technologically green and net zero, and everything on the outside is a void ready to be colonized. In many ways, architecture is still caught in the Eames power of 10, where we are zooming in and out along a single axis, blind to anything outside of, and enabling the frame or the framed. This persistence of singular bounded frames of environments is at odd at this time when every single boundary is being eroded, whether through the crossing of millions of refugees negating national autonomies, the movement of global labor and capital, the production of operational landscapes, as Neil Brenner suggested, or the erosion of boundaries between what is desert and what is fertile, and between land and water. And so today we will at once hold architecture as built environment and simultaneously subvert its disciplinary boundaries to enlist instead its synthetic capacity to draw lines, not as walls and that divide, but as vectors that connect across scales, time, disciplines, and expertise, able to make visible new kinds of relationships draw together local and global, specific and universal, urban and natural, and enable new forms of knowledge, of collaboration, of engagement, and of action. To focus on connecting climate change with a renewed understanding of scales of environment, we will start by recasting the term environment as a historical category. We will then consider how climate change is producing conflict globally, we will ask how scientists and designers can share methodologies in more productive ways and how climate science can be more closely integrated as we strive to better design for uncertainty and for the future. Finally, we will explore how environment is visualized, formed, and disseminated as it enters current climate debates as evidence and a system of rhetorical representation. Despite the sense of this very large territory we will cover across disciplines, expertise, and perspectives, there will be, I anticipate and hope, a sense of convergence. A convergence which I suspect might be echoed and articulated with inspiring clarity, critical incisiveness, and powerful thoughtfulness by our wonderful keynote speaker this evening, Dipesh Chakrabarti, who is joining us all the way from the University of Chicago to share with us what he understands to be the human significance of the Anthropocene. But before turning it over to our first speaker, Reinhold Martin, I wanted to underline the sense of convergence we find ourselves in by reading this short excerpt from Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me. Once, the dream's parameters were caged by technology and by the limits of horsepower and wind. But the dreamers have improved themselves, and the damning of seas for voltage, the extraction of coal, the transmuting of oil into food have enabled an expansion in plunder with no precedent. 
And this revolution has freed the dreamers to plunder not just the bodies of humans, but the body of the earth itself. The earth is not our creation. It has no respect for us. It has no use for us. And its vengeance is not the fire in the cities, but the fire in the sky. Something more fierce than Marcus Garvey is riding on the whirlwind. Something more awful than all our African ancestors is rising with the seas. The two phenomena are known to each other. It was the cotton that passed through our chained hands that inaugurated this age. It is the flight from us that sent them sprawling into the subdivided woods. And the methods of transports through these new subdivisions across the sprawl is the automobile, the noose around the neck of the earth, and ultimately, the dreamers themselves. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Amos. So, uh, I'm Reinhold Martin. I'm here to moderate the first panel, so I won't take up very much of your time at all. Uh, just to um, pick up on, on a little um, cue here uh, from Amal's uh, intro, uh, the image from the, I think it was from the New York Times of the Marshall Islands, you know, disappearing. Um, the, you know, if you're reading, I mean, the occasion, obviously, as, as Amal said, for, for ha having a conference like this, you know, at the very end of the semester, last week of classes and so on here in New York at Columbia uh, is, is uh, at least um, notionally what's happening in, or not happening in Paris uh, in the COP21 talks. The reporting on this has been depressingly thin um, and uh, the time, uh, you know, with, with the exception of articles like the one in the Times and a few others, um, the ever uh, tenacious and reliable Amy Goodman at Democracy Now! has been spending, maybe you've, you've followed some of this, spending uh, the whole week there, and uh, this morning interviewed uh, James Hansen, who's a Columbia faculty member from the Earth Institute here, and maybe you know, uh, before he did that, was uh, director of the Goddard Space Institute over uh, in here, here on Broadway. Um, which this is the in the Seinfeld building where John Dewey used to live, the amazing convergence of these things, um, uh, and was among the first to testify to Congress in 1988, I think it was, uh, about the facts uh, that bring us together um, today. Uh, there was another kind of interesting. Um, there's another. This was mentioned actually in the interview that she did with him, and again, maybe you've heard that a kind of let's say tie-in, a reason maybe that that. Was, to do something like this uh, here at Columbia. Um, our colleagues uh, in the journalism school, you, you may have heard, um, uh, in uh, something called the Energy and Environmental Reporting Fellowship, recent graduates, in fact, from the journalism program, so students like yourself, recent grads, uh, published, there was a, a team from this program, published an article in, in the Los Angeles Times, um, again, along very much the same lines, explaining <coughs> how historically ExxonMobil uh, apparently knew more than was eventually disclosed about the consequences of fossil fuels and so on, uh, environmentally and, and otherwise. Um, and uh, so this article was published from the J School uh, and uh, shortly thereafter a letter arrived uh, in President Bollinger's office that was then itself published, uh, more or less threatening uh, from ExxonMobil uh, in you know a not so veiled threat to withdraw its relationships with the university, um, you know contesting the the reporting that had been done. Uh, to its to their credit, the journalism school responded vigorously and 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 you know uh, and with great professionalism. So um, you know this is this matters. I mean and, and 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 what matters here is as much what we do in universities as what we might do in the street or in out there in in the so-called real world. And these are examples of of things that uh, universities do in, from you know, the, the basic science to, to the uh, interventions in the public sphere um, around issues of all kinds and, and very, very importantly, this issue. Uh, maybe also you, you caught a glimpse of Paul Krugman's uh, article, uh, editorial in the Times today, this morning, uh, that begins something like, um, when historians of the future write about what happened in December 2015, they will say these historians, if they exist, um, and I'm paraphrasing, if they exist, these historians will say that the most important thing that happened in December 2015 was, was the Paris talks. Keyword historians um, of the future, if they exist, okay. Uh, but that's what we have today, uh, a group of historians this morning and scholars uh, to, to open up the conference, uh, to open up in, in that sense 
uh, with history, to, with, with, with you know, all the, the, the many dimensions of history, of culture, uh, and, and of conflict uh, that, that, that define uh, historical processes. Um, and so I will, uh, in order to, to allow them to speak, I'm only going to, to introduce them by title. The abstracts are all there in, in your bulletin. Um, uh, and so basically you can follow along as, as they go. So our, our first speaker uh, is also Daniel Barber, who is a graduate of, uh, of the PhD program here. And, he, and we're gonna, in a sense, begin with Columbia, uh, as I just did as well, and, uh, and then kind of go around the world uh, in various ways. So, so Daniel um, <clears throat> is currently the, the Curry C. and Thomas A. Barron Visiting Professor in Environment and, in, and Humanities at the Princeton Environmental Institute and School of Architecture, and um, otherwise an Assistant Professor of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design. Daniel Barber. How do I get my, uh, okay. Uh, good morning, uh, thank you, Reinhold. Thank you to them all for uh, bringing this group of us together. Uh, really a pleasure to be participating in this conference. Uh, I'm going to talk and show slides, I hope, um, about the history of architecture and climate, um, and about how climate has been an important concept in the historical trajectory of architectural projects and ideas since at least the mid 20th century. And so I'm gonna begin, as Reinhold suggested, right here uh, in this room, or, or at least you know, quite nearby, um, where in the 1950s, a group of students at what was then called the Columbia Graduate School of Architecture initiated the Form and Climate Research Group. Working with a number of faculty, they sought to develop techniques for refining the design process according to climatic adaptability. So in order to make this group uh, sort of sensible to, to understand how and why an interest in climate would have emerged in the 1950s, I want to this morning sort of inflect the conference premise slightly towards the, the scales of history, right? Uh, and, and not only, uh, or, or really not so much in terms of time frame, you know, a sort of long view or short view, as much uh, interesting material coming out of this kind of Anthropocene premise has, has encouraged, uh, but more on a sort of discursive and pedagogic terms, right? Uh, in which the large scale, what I want to call the disciplinary scale, allows us to sort of reconsider the contours of architectural history and to sort of begin to redraft those contours in relationship to the increasing uncertainty of our environmental future. So I'm gonna go back and forth between what I'm proposing as this sort of disciplinary scale and the smaller scale, right, the sort of case study scale of the research group as a means to think through some of these issues. And, and you know, the stakes here are really sort of on this historiographic level that the tools of design and material innovation, right, the sort of history of these uh, characteristics of the design process that we sort of bunched together as modern architecture, and we'll talk about a few of them, uh, were profoundly inflected by climate uh, considerations, right? Uh, and these stakes posit that perhaps as much as the challenge to architecture is to sort of engage, as I'm sure we'll hear about in various ways, with the materiality and energy efficiency of the climate crisis, as we'll also hear about, right, and this is sort of, in a way, framing uh, uh, this device, it, the climate crisis uh, is, is also, also has an immaterial aspect, right, a sort of discursive aspect. So, so the point being that the way we're going to be talking about architecture and climate, the environment more broadly, uh, uh, as much through technological means to manage it, uh, and as sort of how we're going to get through this, right, as a culture, sort of what we're going to do with ourselves. So across these two scales, I want to offer two framing concepts for how the history of architecture can begin to be inflected on these terms. The first is the premise of adaptability. What architecture offered in the early and mid 20th century was something of a technological apparatus, right, engaged with materials, technologies, and concepts, and appropriate to a wide range of situations, and indeed conceived on terms of a capacity to adapt a general principle to a specific site, right? And we in architecture know this already through the domino diagram on the left, its capacity to suggest according to a very simple set, right, of new parameters, the steel beams, reinforced concrete floors, a wide range of applications and adaptations. And the attempt here quite directly for a sort of an idea at the scale of the discipline, right, to transform the built environment. 
The Forum and Climate Research Group focused on a sort of specific set of adaptive design technologies that we see on the right that were referred to as negative methods, which is to say using the roof or a shading device to strategically block solar radiation from entering the building. The basic premise, as we can see in Le Corbusier's drawing up on the top right in particular, um, uh, is that a shading fin or extended eave can prevent the sun from entering in the summer, eight day, and, and allow it in en hiver, right, uh, in the winter when you want that warmth and radiation in the room. Uh, there was a lot of interest in shading in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, Le Corbusier, of course, had famously sort of invented, right, he did a lot of inventing, as we know, uh, invented the Brie Soleil or the sun breaker in 1928, and that didn't so much quickly spread as it kind of became evident that it had been spreading already, and I think in many ways this sort of basic premise of the shading system uh, operates really you know, on this sort of diagrammatic and disciplinary scale on the same level uh, uh, in many ways as the domino. Uh, Rainer Banham, of course, referring to the Brie Soleil as uh, Le Corbusier's most masterful invention. So what we're beginning to see as the examples I want to be showing here start to aggregate is that the means by which modern architectural strategies globalized in the first half of the 20th century before HVAC systems were widely available <clears throat> was largely through the shading device, right? An adaptive method that could adjust a building to its climatic location. Locations that were often in what we now call the global south, right? Regions then being subjected to new forms of economic management and industrial development, and buildings that were often designed and built according to government initiatives, right? The Ministry of Education and Health, for example, a best known sort of symbol of this premise of, of uh, modernization on the sort of social health uh, education, right, architectural terms, or often also for emerging industries and globalizing corporations. Some of the uh, early modern shaded structures, in addition to right, elements like the ministry, uh, were built in Brazil for uh, insurance companies uh, using climatic methods. <clears throat> in this case, not only shading, but the sort of careful manipulation of the horizontal window with reference uh, to its scientific derivation according to solar incidence uh, and directed towards rendering more comfortable the emergent space of a global interior. So this sort of global view of climate and architecture and its imbrication with geopolitics and geophysics actually entered the form and climate group's research through their analysis of Richard Neutra's wartime work in Puerto Rico. <clears throat> In 1944, Neutra was commissioned to build a number of schools and hospitals around the island, and he developed a series of prototype designs with uh, specific climate, climate methods, right? Mostly focused on ventilation. You see the open air schools, and, and then this uh, sub soffit airflow system that he used to ventilate uh, multi story hospital blocks. Neutra was at the time the U.S. representative for CM and also the architectural discussant at the San Francisco meeting that inaugurated the United Nations in 1945. <clears throat> he wrote about this work, uh, oh, sorry, there we go. He wrote about this work uh, in a number of articles and letters as a, quote, planetary test. And I think this term that Neutra uses, right, is a nice kind of uh, rephrasing of the international style as a term to consider the adaptable and seemingly universal premise of modern architecture on these disciplinary terms. Neutra's planetary test in Puerto Rico with correlates in West Africa, India, Singapore, many other regions, was trying to find out how modern architecture could, through, <coughs> through climate methods, improve the quality of life in what were beginning to be called developing economies. The shift from international, right, to planetary, uh, I think is a nice way to open up the analysis of the globe to the geophysical and environmental conditions in which architects were then being asked and asking themselves to engage. At the same time, this sort of shift from style to test, right, international style to planetary test, rereads familiar terms of modernist functionalism towards a, a sort of operationalism, right, at the extent to which a lot of these architectural strategies of climatic adaptability were also enmeshed in the process of modernization simultaneously as cultural objects and infrastructural interventions. And often, again, according to a very specific set of corporate or governmental aspirations. And I think this building, right, these kind of historians of the future, uh, again, as Reinhold referenced, this, the, the British, British Petroleum headquarters in Lagos, 
built by Brian Drew will perhaps be an important uh, sort of monument in the history of architecture of the future for the clarity of it as an internet and the sort of international form of corporate organization for the precise use of a complex shading system and as evidence of how colonial powers were refashioned as corporate entities and redirected towards resource extraction. More broadly, this uh, sort of diagrammatic generative aspect of the Brice Soleil opens up our understanding of architectural history and as projects such as this resonate uh, uh, into the sort of complex means by which environments became available to economies, right? And these kind of peripheral examples, again, kind of migrate towards the center. Okay, I don't have time for this slide. Um, okay, the second uh, 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 figure of thought that climate places in relief <clears throat> in examining architectural history, thank you. could you hand me the water? Um, thank you. Uh, places in relief in examining architectural histories, in addition to adaptability, right, is this question of normativity. And an opportunity to reassess here, uh, Le Corbusier, again, uh, his 1930 dictum, that quote, every building around the globe will be 18 degrees, right, uh, which is about 65, so we're, we're pretty hot in here today, right, but sort of this notion of a, a global space of modernity. One could fly from Rio to Lagos, not to mention Paris, and experience a uniform interior uh, conceptualized as the space of capital and management, of leisure and, leisure and self-realization. Climate begins to appear here uh, as both a challenge, uh, a set of complex factors that architects had to encounter, and an aspiration, an end for which a careful approach to design was the means. So this was another driver for a lot of climate methods, this assumption that all, all uh, humans have a sort of optimum climatic state and that architecture can find ways to produce it. So let's kind of zoom back in to the form and climate group here, uh, which was supported at the time in large part by the historian uh, James Marston Fitch, who taught initially in the night school. They used to distinguish between night school and day school in architecture, apparently. Um, um, taught in the night school and then full time from 1954, uh, before or really as, I'm sorry, teaching here at Columbia, right? So we're sort of back to the Columbia uh, scenario uh, where, where Fitch was working with this group on form and climate. Before, or really as uh, Fitch was becoming a champion of preservation that we know him as today, <coughs> he was tightly focused on how a building could be designed to best accommodate itself to the private climate of the site. Uh, sorry, precise climate of the site. He'd spent the war as a meteorologist and was fascinated by the visual tools used to represent climatic patterns. In 1947, just as his American building, The Forces That Shape It, was being published, he co-wrote an article on microclimate and house design with one of his wartime colleagues. The intense specificity of the climate problem was, to Fish and his colleagues, quite daunting. Uh, and they, you know, they sort of developed these means of sort of mapping and examining sites accordingly. Expansion into the suburbs on the one hand and interest in the applied possibilities of scientific research on the other informed a number of discussions about architecture and climate in the American context in the 1940s and 50s. The goal of this research was to develop methods, right, to understand site-specific cli site -specific climates and designs accordingly. And I'm going to just sort of walk through uh, very quickly some of the work that Fitch uh, was involved with that was the climate control project developing uh, out of the House Beautiful magazine in collaboration with the AIA, so an interesting sort of set of, of institutional uh, uh, partners there, uh, which was it, intending to provide climate data to architects and, uh, and their clients, right, around, uh, around the country and this establishment of a set of regional maps and sort of systems of working through this uh, to develop, right, to sort of turn your house uh, turn your living experience into a more climatically uh, efficient space. Uh, based to some extent on, you know, and this sort of comes out as Elizabeth Gordon, the um, editor of House Beautiful in the period, eventually writes her sort of, um, you know, manifesto against modernism or sort of xenophobic manifesto, the uh, threat to the next America. Uh, and to some extent, you know, this material we have to recognize is based on this kind of premise of climatic determinism, right? That there's a, a sort of ideal condition in which one should live that architects can design for. Um, but I want to just kind of conclude by indicating that uh, uh, these different forms of um, climatic analysis came together as well through processes of simulation. And one of the most sort of prominent of which was the thermoheliodon here at the Princeton Architectural Laboratory and all sorts of kind of interconnections between this group and the form and climate group 
that I won't get into the details of. But this Thermoheliodon was interesting in that it sort of elaborated on the basic premise of the SunArc uh, simulation device to provide humidity, uh, wind direction, right, even the sort of conditions of the soil and was also instrumental in providing a method uh, helping the uh, Olgai brothers that we see here uh, on the right, Victor and Aldor Olgai, develop a very complex, uh, there we go, uh, a very complex and sort of arcane uh, method to design precisely on these terms. Uh, the method seems to answer, right, the sort of general imperative that Fish put forward, a sort of quasi-scientific means to understand the climate conditions of a site and to provide parameters to the design of the building accordingly that was also aimed precisely at the production of a sort of uniform interior space of stability, right? I mean, we're all effectively relative to what it's like outside, relaxing on a chaise, right, smoking a pipe. We're in a kind of conditioned arena uh, that allows for uh, comfort to persist. Uh, so aimed at this production of a of a uniform interior space of stability, of a reified sense of the human in its ideal state. This mid-century discourse on climate methods hummed with this imperative for stasis, uniformity, normativity in the ideal conditions for life. It is in part uh, the unintended consequences of these design methods that we are talking about today here uh, in Paris and, and elsewhere. To reconsider the history of architecture on these terms, on the adaptable production of, modern, of normativity, and to think of architecture as a planetary test as much as an international style, helps us also to recognize that the historical development of the discipline here by the end of the 1950s is also the story of the wild proliferation of air-conditioned buildings, right, some of which Amal showed us in the introduction. Buildings, perhaps more than anything, that are the accelerators, right, of the great acceleration through which the Anthropocene has emerged. <coughs> Uh, it's not so much to say that the methods that I've been describing didn't work, but that they worked differently. Uh, the OGI's method in particular was sort of absorbed by the HVAC industry uh, to provide parameters for ASHRAE regulations as they clarify the architectural and physiological terms of the comfort zone uh, that we are all now sort of forced to inhabit, right? We have collectively so far seemingly failed this test of how to live on the planet due to factors that could not have been imagined. And I hope that these sorts of historiographic and discursive interventions, such as we'll see today, can facilitate new questions, new experiments, and new concepts as imperatives for adaptability and resilience persist. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Life in and out of the comfort zone. Um, so uh, we now are joined by our colleague from just across Broadway, um, Deborah Cohen, uh, who is a professor of history at Barnard College, uh, where she teaches modern Central European history and the history of science, um, and directs the research cluster on Envi environmental sciences and the humanities at the Columbia Center for Science and Society, a new organization here at Columbia, um, and is also a member of uh, Columbia's Committee on Global Thought. Thank you, Reinhold, um, and thanks, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Mm. So it's been said that climate change is a problem that's too big to think. To quote philosopher Dale Jameson, the scale of a problem like global warming can be crippling. Social scientists doubt that humans possess ethical intuitions about the consequences of our actions across continents and generations. The literary scholar Tim Morden calls global warming a hyperobject that remains just beyond the grasp of human understanding. How can this be? If climate change ex exceeds our understanding, then how exactly have scientists come to know what they know about it? I want to question two aspects of this discourse in particular. First, it's a historical conception of the human scale. And second, it's assumption that scientists have only explained what it now falls to humanists to understand. My research challenges the discourse by taking a phenomenological approach to the history of climate science, reconstructing the experiential context in which this science developed. It turns out that essential foundations of modern climate science arose precisely as a means of representing disparate dimensions of space and time in a state 
the multinational Habsburg monarchy, where such thinking was a political imperative. So my history of Habsburg climatology is a history of scaling. By scaling, I mean the work of mediating between different systems of measurement, formal or informal, designed to apply to different slices of the phenomenal world. Scaling is something we all do every day. It's how we decide, for instance, what difference one individual's vote will make to a national election, or whether buying a hybrid car might slow global warming. It's certainly something architects do every day. Scaling, in other words, is the process of situating the known world in relation to times or places that are distant, intangible, or otherwise inaccessible to direct experience. A focus on scaling is not just a useful approach to Habsburg history. It's a recourse for the field of history more broadly, I think, caught up as it is in debates over the appropriate scale of historical analysis. Debates between those calling for bigger, deeper histories to help address the geopolitical and environmental questions of the 21st century, and those who worry, rightly in my view, that such approaches sacrifice an appreciation of human difference and human agency. Rather than taking sides, I'm following the lead of historians like Francesca Travolato and Emma Rothschild, who suggest that we study how our actors themselves have thought and acted at multiple scales. So here we have the first map ever to be published in the Habsburg lands, depicting the entirety of the dynasty's modern territories, stretching from the Alps to the Adriatic to the Hungarian steppe. The publication of a map like this was an injunction to the subjects of the state to situate themselves and their concerns with respect to this vast territory, its diverse human population, and its varied natural resources. Ever since the fall of this monarchy in 1918, historians have inquired into the ideologies that bound this multinational state together in an age of nationalization, and they have looked for answers in the domain of high politics, in the transnational ideologies of political parties like the Christian Socials and Social Democrats, or in the rituals, images, and monuments that expressed personal loyalty to the emperor. One place they have not looked for a unifying idea is the natural sciences. Um, here's a detail of the first map of the whole monarchy produced in secret for the army in 1747, a giant wall map measuring two by two and a half meters. It was dedicated to the Empress Maria Theresa and came with an allegorical drawing depicting the tools of cartography. Um, you can see a globe and a map of Vienna on the right, um, and note the measuring rod at the bottom, um, attesting to the map's consistent scale. But much of the detail of local topography was still unknown and unrepresented, and no attempt was made to represent elevation precisely. So all that was yet to come. It's in the late 18th century that an explosion of map making took place in the Habsburg lands, um, and this cartographic boom was driven in part by an economic upturn linked to improvements in transport and communication. Notably, um, the first published map of the entire monarchy was of postal routes, this um, one from 1782. And the cartouche on the left there um, invited the viewer to imagine riding the postal coach right, through winding roads um, in the company of other travelers. The late 18th century also saw the first of what we would call economic maps of the Habsburg lands. Um, a newspaper of the day said of this map, the main focus is on familiarizing a worthy public with the natural treasures and manufactured products of each province. In other words, the priority was on providing as much information as possible, and as you can see, the result is overcrowding. It's that problem of representing local detail within an empire-wide overview that drives the rich innovations of 19th century Habsburg cartography. For instance, how do you represent elevation on a map that includes both the Hungarian plains and the Alps? How do you draw isotherms, lines connecting points of equal average temperature, through mountainous regions given the variable decrease um, in temperature with height? So this is a map from the first ever physical and demographic atlas of the monarchy, um, published in the 1880s. After World War I, this atlas would continue to be cited by an advisor to Woodrow Wilson as, quote, still the best cartographic introduction to Austrian problems. These maps begin with climate and move on to hydrography, geology, vegetation, from there to demography and ethnography. 
So this one is of the heat distribution in July. Here we have the distribution of days with storms, a map of forests, a map of population density. Many of the later maps refer back to earlier ones in order to emphasize the interdependence of human and environmental factors. Amusingly, one double page spread presents four uniformly scaled and colored maps of the monarchy, illustrating the distribution of four factors, towns, hailfall, illiterates, and pigs. <laughs> so this atlas displays ingenious solutions to the Austrian problem of the unified representation of diversity. I argue in the book I'm writing that it was this same problem that propelled Habsburg scientists to develop many of their innovations in climate science, including what atmospheric scientists today call scale analysis, in other words, for any given dimensions of observation, determining which forces need to be taken into account and which are negligible. And the first model of the global circulation to include phenomena on the scale of everyday life, right, like ordinary storms. That is to say, if you want to understand why Habsburg scientists conducted um, climate research on scales ranging from the general circulation of the atmosphere to the climate of a patch of skin, you have to understand their responsibilities as imperial royal Kaiserlich Königlich scientists. Now, this effort to represent the near in relation to the far left its mark beyond climatology. In fact, it's possible to trace an intimate exchange between the Austrian geosciences and painting and literature in the 19th century. One example will have to suffice today, and that's the landscape paintings of Friedrich Simoni. So Simoni was the first professor of physical geography at the University of Vienna, the first to insist that this discipline of geography needed to take the entirety of the Habsburg's territories as its field of study. Remember, earlier maps had never shown the territory as a whole. Um, and Simoni insisted on communicating this information to the public in word and image, as he put it, using large-scale visual aids, panoramas, profiles, graphs, landscapes. He also introduced visual methods for capturing fine green detail within compositions that were nonetheless clearly legible as foreground, middle ground, and background. Um, and you're all much better readers of visual evidence than I am, um, so um, I won't point out exactly how he did that. Um, I just want to note that he was also an avid um, scientific photographer, but photography could not achieve that same effect, and so Simoni often added details to the backgrounds of his landscape photographs. So all this suggests a new historical question. Instead of asking what idea did this state rest on, what if we ask what resources did Habsburg subjects have in the 19th century for thinking the idea of Austria? Recasting the question in this way amounts to a shift from a history of ideas to a history of an intellectual and material process, the process of scaling. To understand the work of scaling in the late Habsburg monarchy, I found it fitting to borrow from the phenomenology of Edmund Husserl, born in Moravia in 1859. Husserl's phenomenology developed as a diagnosis of the state of the natural sciences in Central Europe in this period, and his quest for the historical human meaning of natural science resonates with aspirations articulated by Habsburg scientists themselves. Much as Husserl sought to translate between absolute and lived scales of experience, so did Habsburg scientists seek to reconcile the standardized data of observing networks with their own mobile, full-bodied, and multi-sensory impressions. Husserl's phenomenology was a quest for the pre-scientific experiences out of which science had developed historically and from which it had derived its original human meaning. According to Husserl, the pre-scientific or natural world is known in large part through kinesthesis, that is, the sensations of one's own bodily movements. The natural world, in his term, is organized by a division between near and far as defined by one's own body, which he called the null point. Yet conscious movement has the potential to break down this divide and replace it with a scale permitting statements about relative proximity. In a very similar vein, Habsburg climatologists argued that personal observations recorded in transit 
often on the basis of sensory impressions, could correct and complement data from networks of permanent observing stations. In phenomenological terms, they sought to reconcile the lived scale of first-hand measurements with the absolute scale of station data. In this sense, scaling is partly a bodily experience tied to movement through space and time, but it's also a social process. The near is defined in part by what is familiar, by one's own community, while knowledge of the far often comes more from other people than from firsthand experience. When we consider scaling across dimensions of time, this social aspect is especially conspicuous. Our access to the past, to what is distant in time rather than space, typically comes from memories other than our own. Scaling thus becomes a process of commensuration, that is, of negotiation between dimensions marked out by the tools of experts on one hand and by communal identities and collective memory on the other. As the leading climatologist of the 19th century, Vienna's Julius Hahn put it, the natural scientist is used to taking the effects of small causes into account. The uneducated mind disregards them, concerning itself only with forces that have compelled it to astonishment or fear. I argue that Hobsburg climate scientists built their public authority on their capacity to judge rightly the significance of small things, to set local details in relation to a synthetic overview. Now, to decipher how they built that authority is the task of the historian, and that requires an array of different apertures and lenses from the local to the global, from the short term to the long. Thank you. All right, scales of environment indeed. Um, okay, well, next up, um, thanks, uh, Deborah. We, we, next is uh, Greg uh, Mittman, um, whom uh, you will know as the Villas Research and William Coleman Professor of History of Science, Medical History and Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, where he is the founding director of the Nelson Institute's Center for Culture, History, and Environment, and also curates uh, the UW Medicine's popular environmental film festival, Tales from Planet Earth, among many other things. Uh, great. Thanks, Reinhold, and uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. In this workshop on climate change and the scales of environment, in a week where 40,000 delegates from 195 countries are gathered in Paris to debate planetary futures, I wish to open my remarks by showing a map that depicts the inequitable disease burdens wrought by climate change across the globe. Published in the journal EcoHealth, this global scale map contrasts the disproportionate carbon dioxide emissions per country with the regional distribution of four climate sensitive health effects, malaria, malnutrition, diarrhea, and inland flood related fatalities. Africa, a continent that has contributed the least to global warming, is also the continent likely to suffer most from climate related maladies. But this global view of environment and a disease obscures as much as it makes visible. Reminiscent of 19th century global disease maps produced in the age of empire, this newer map renders the differential ecology of disease as a rather simplistic relationship between climate, geography, and life. Missing from this picture are a whole set of economic, social, and political relations from colonialism, to histories of biomedical and resource extraction, from civil wars to decimated infrastructures, from structural adjustment to vertical approaches to global health that altered environments and associated forms of life on a global scale. I want to zoom in on Africa and specifically Liberia to think more broadly about how ecological understandings of disease were enmeshed in the political economy of American empire, and how such understandings nevertheless largely ignored the transformative relations of capital while reinforcing the too simplistic nature-society divide. I will end my remarks by asking how the recent Ebola outbreak might help us interrogate 
and reconsider what constitutes the important ecological relationships of disease that need to be made visible as anthropogenic change continues to reshape disease emergence across the globe. Liberia is a fitting place to explore the different scalar politics at play in thinking about the environment of a virus, from the dynamics of host microbe interactions to the cycles of global capital. On the industrial plantations of Firestone Tire and Rubber Company in Liberia, diverse tropical rainforests gave way to vast uniform landscapes of rubber trees planted to satiate the demands of America's growing automotive industry in the early 20th century. The Firestone plantations constituted one important laboratory whereby disease came to be seen for the first time in ecological and evolutionary terms. For this audience, the early 20th century industrial spaces of the city, lead paint factories, Chicago slaughterhouses, Ford assembly lines, may be familiar as places where industrial hygiene and ecological views of health emerged. But capital was both creating and making visible new sets of relations between humans, disease, and the built environment in places other than urban factories. In the tropics, in the built environments of the coffee and rubber plantations of American firms, such as United Fruit and the Firestone Plantations Company, disease threatened the efficiency of labor, and microorganisms found new favorable conditions of life. Firms like United Fruit and Firestone depended deeply on scientific knowledge to manage the interrelationships of people, plants, and microbes and turn nature into profits. Physicians, parasitologists, mammologists, and botanists were willing partners. Consider, for example, Harvard's Department of Tropical Medicine, headed by Richard Strong, one of the first to coin the word disease ecology. Nearly all of the department's expeditions in the 19-teens and 20s were to industrial plantations in the making. Uh, this is just a map of some of the expeditions from that Harvard's department. The red crosses are the hospitals of United Fruit, so you see the close overlay. Um, and eventually when they would go to Liberia, and I'll talk about that briefly, they basically uh, recreated the circuitous route of the transatlantic slave trade, which actually figured much into their evolutionary and ecological understanding of disease. It is not by coincidence that Strong characterized the department's work as industrial hygiene. Harvard's department was thoroughly entangled in the material relationships, transportation infrastructures like these shipping routes of United Fruit, labor regimes, and commodity production that were instrumental in advancing the interests of multinational firms as they transformed landscapes across the globe. Ecological ideas of disease were born of these material transformations and in turn materially transformed landscapes and lives. Understanding the ecological and evolutionary conditions that transformed organisms from harmless saprophytes into highly pathogenic parasites was a question central to Harvard's department in the interwar years. Equilibrium concepts advanced by Walter Cannon, Lauren Henderson, and others associated with Harvard's fatigue lab also played a key role in understanding of disease and parasitism as an imbalance in the interrelationship among organisms. And here I think there's an interesting connection to Dan's uh, talk because it was at the Harvard fatigue lab where a lot of work on the physiology of work and, and determining optimal indoor climate conditions for work was taking place. As Strong noted, to United Fruit shareholders in 1914, when the opening of the Camp Panama Canal was poised to alter biogeographic and economic relations, the ideal balance, quote, found among organisms living in a mutually beneficial relationship, even if attained, becomes frequently disturbed. And in some group of animals, sooner or later, one organism becomes more dependent upon the other and the symbiotic relationship passes into one of parasitism. Onchocerciasis, a tropical disease also known as river blindness, was one parasite of capital that captured the group's attention. It came into being as a scientific object on the industrial coffee and rubber plantations of Central America and West Africa. 
At a 1924 conference in Jamaica sponsored by United Fruit, Strong learned that up to 70% of Guatemalan coffee plantation workers were infected with a parasitic nematode. Uh, and this is a map of Guatemala. That gray area is all where Onchocerciasis was endemic and it closely correlated with the coffee plantations of United Fruit. Such high rates of infection launched a decade-long Harvard study that spanned two continents, four countries, and four expeditions, and was aided by the commodity flows of coffee, rubber, and cotton in a period of rapidly expanding American economic globalization. As global travelers who witnessed and partook in the redistribution of life through industrial plantations, imperial conquest, and world war, these Harvard scientists looked to the movement of microbes across space and time in mapping out the ecology, geography, and life cycle of parasites affecting industrial landscapes in the making. Through such studies, Strong and his colleagues became convinced that the life history and habits of humans were far more important than the ecology of the nematode and its fly vector in the spread of onchocerciasis. The seasonal nature of work on the coffee plantations, which brought transient and permanent residents together at harvest time, created environmental conditions ripe for infection and spread. It is evident, Strong concluded, that the quote, the coffee industry in Guatemala has played an important role in the dissemination of the disease. One might readily infer from Strong's explanation that aquasarchiasis was a creation of capital, traveling through and flourishing in the itineraries and infrastructures of commodity production, which the Harvard team, in their evolutionary understandings of the disease, extended back to the transatlantic slave trade. In this reading, to borrow from Jason Moore, capitalism does not have an ecological regime, it is an ecological regime. But this was not the origin story that either Strong or his corporate sponsors sought to tell. Theirs was not a declensionist tale in which the fall from a tropical Eden in balance unleashed a furry of parasites in revenge, as was inherent in a later generation of scholarship from Crosby's ecological imperialism to McNeil's plagues and people. Rather, Strong told a tale of development and progress aided by the miracle of modern medicine. Throughout the 20th century, Firestone, which by the early 1950s had built nearly 1,000 miles of roads in Liberia, along which more than 40,000 tons of latex and 15,000 laborers moved, emphasized the ways that industrial hygiene and engineering had subdued tropical nature, transforming it into a landscape of health and prosperity. The company also greatly helped strengthen a government of autocracy, which eventually tumbled during a brutal 14-year civil war in Liberia that ended in 2003. In the wake of the war, the Liberian government once again sought economic development through direct foreign investment in the natural resource sector. Recent estimates suggest that 50% of Liberian public lands have been ceded to multinational companies for large-scale oil, palm, logging, and mining concessions. But the narratives of landscape change and the ecology of disease reshaping the economy and culture of Liberia remain locked in a nature society dichotomy that dates to the early history of disease ecology I have outlined here. Firestone seized on yet another tale of disease emergence out of the tropical jungle, Ebola to affirm the success of neoliberal approaches to global health and development. Firestone did what governments have not, heralded the headlines of international media in October of 2014. Through a coordinated system of isolation wards, quarantine centers, and epidemiological surveillance, Firestone had just three Ebola cases on its 185 square mile plantation at the height of the Ebola epidemic in Liberia. When CDC Dr. Brendan Flannery was asked what was needed to respond to the crisis, she replied, more firestones. Through the wonders of tropical medicine critical to its existence in Liberia and its system of corporate control, Firestone claimed to have kept Ebola at bay, while in the streets of Monrovia and in rural villages, society succumbed to nature. NGOs similarly seized on the Ebola outbreak 
but to speak critically of land grabs proliferating in West Africa. A widely circulated article by Richard Koch, professor of wildlife health and emerging diseases at the Royal Veterinary College, argued, and I quote, that the explosive spread of industrial oil palm, which disrupts the ecology of forests and farms, was likely the origin of the outbreak. The effects of land grabs, Koch went on, leads to an Ali effect, where sudden changes in one ecological element causes the mechanisms for keeping population, bats in this case, and viruses in equilibrium to shift, increasing the probability of spillover to alternative hosts. In this scenario, Ebola was nature's revenge for society's destruction of the tropical rainforest. Like Strong 100 years ago, contemporary disease ecologists too often conflate pathogen emergence with the geography of causality, ignoring the socio-spatial relations across global and economic actors. How might we think about disease emergence in ways that move beyond state tropes of equilibrium balance and nature-society relations? Rethinking the geography of disease is a start. Following commodities and diseases through capital, reshaping forms of life potentially reverses causality, notes evolutionary biologist Robert Wallace, turning New York, London, and Hong Kong, key centers of global capital, into the three of the world's worst hotspots instead. Parasitism also becomes a troubled category of life, as the normative and the pathological inherent to its negative valuation are replaced by relative adaptation of different life forms to dynamic complex systems. The Ebola virus and its likely future endemic existence in West Africa thus might help us see a different ecology of disease. It is an ecology grounded not in the biosecurity threat of life emerging from the tropical jungle. Instead, as the following quip from our film In the Shadow of Ebola, which is available on PBS Independent Lens, suggests, this different ecology of disease is attentive to infrastructure and to the history of environmental and social inequalities, inequalities conducive to a virus's spread. It is an ecology to which a school of architecture, planning, and preservation has much to contribute. And I just want to end with this uh, clip from the film. If I could just bring that up. Short clip. It's showing up here. It's there? Yeah, it's here. Stand by. It's showing up on the screen here. Or maybe we should go on to the next speaker. I know we're really tight on time, so. Looks like the. Oh, the projector went off.
No sound. Yeah. <laughs> Able to have little no public health infrastructure. Of course, it boiled down heavily to the last 14 years of civil war that everything has was destroyed in the country. Liberia was working hard to reconcile people. You know, when the United Nations went in there, tried to train the police and the military to deter further war in the future. There are a lot of factors that are causing Liberia to have little or no public health infrastructure. Of course, it boiled down heavily to the last 14 years of civil war that everything has, was destroyed in the country. Liberia was working hard to reconcile people. You know, when the United Nations went in there, tried to train the police and the military to deter further war in the future. But unfortunately, there was nothing done on the side of the health of the population. And here we have the Ebola today a complete different war that nobody expected. And this, uh, this is West Point, a poorest slum in Monrovia, where the largest uh, outbreak hit in Monrovia. It's also the one uh, most threatened by rising seas. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, and apologies for the, I was just bragging about the high-tech setup we have here. There it goes. Okay, uh, finally, um, Al Weitzman, uh, whose bio is a little bit out of date in the, uh, in the printout, so I'll, uh, it's hard to keep up with Al. I'll just tell you that he is an architect, professor of visual, cult professor of visual cultures, and director of the Center of Research Architecture at Goldsmith University of uh, of London, uh, and since 2011, he has been directing the European Research Council-funded project Forensic Architecture um, on the Place of Architecture in uh, International Humanitarian Law, and we're going to, I think, hear a bit about his, the extension of this work now into issues to do with uh, climate and colonial, colonialism. Yeah. I'm uh, very happy to be here, and I think that what I'd like to speak about today is not so much about uh, design um, for climate change, but the design of climate change, and to a certain extent, a conception of the Earth as a, as a design object. And um, this is uh, coming out of uh, a work that will culminate uh, at the end of this month, in, in fact, in the last day uh, of this year uh, in a truth commission that forensic architecture together with the uh, Aturi community of Bedouins in the Israeli Negev desert and the Israeli anti-colonialist feminist group Zohot are putting together. Uh, and it's a kind of special type, we think, of a truth commission uh, because it includes um, environmental crime. It includes the kind of the long duration of environmental transformation that is spoken together with uh, the political history of the area and, of course, uh, of the Nakba. I think that uh, one of the starting points of our, of our understanding, of understanding climate change from the point of view of its victims, is to understand that, um, that the, something about the structure of the argument as it is being articulated also by the most militant critics and activists that are confronting issues of climate change now in Paris here. I must say all, uh, it's a global issue everywhere. And that is that um, because the understanding, and it's scientifically correct, uh, that climate change is uh, a result of um, CO2 emissions, of uh, atmospheric change, uh, of fo burning of fossil fuels, is the understanding that climate change is the collateral damage of history, right? The collateral damage of an attempt of development, of trade, uh, of progress, and that is an unintentional byproduct uh, from it. Now, for anyone that has been uh, working in relation to conflict, any, any uh, argument of climate change is obviously immediately um, making all the light bulbs, all the warning lights uh, flash. What do you mean uh, collateral damage uh, of history, something that is unin unintended? No? We know 
when, what, what, what uh, militaries mean when they say collateral damage. They try to attack military groups or guerrilla groups, and they hurt civilians, thousands of civilians, uh, tens of thousands of civilians in Iraq, in Syria, uh, in Palestine, in Lebanon. When you make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs. So whenever the collateral is invoked, um, we need to be, we need, or whenever a structure that kind of places even climate change as a collateral of history, uh, we need, I think, our responsibility is to rethink that uh, category. Because if we do think about climate change from the multiple perspective of colonial history, we can see that it has first been mentioned not as a byproduct, not as an unintended consequence, but as a project, as an intended thing, as part and parcel of the aims of various uh, colonial projects uh, in, um, in, 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 in the Americas, in Australia, and also, of course, uh, in Israel-Palestine. Um, heating cold places, warming uh, colder ones, increasing precipitation, um, has been part and parcel of, of, of all these attempts. In a, and, and the examples, uh, I'm sure that our historians could, could help um, uh, uh, exhibit better, better than I do, but uh, I, I think that in this country, uh, certainly uh, even people like Thomas Jefferson and others at the turn of the 19th century were articulating something that was later, in fact, discredited as an economical fact, but had an enormous uh, influence on the way in which uh, the frontiers were actually domesticated, understood that the expansion of agricultural frontier is not simply making, taking over new land, displacing people, but conditioning it. In order to take over the great American desert, people like uh, Charles Espy proposed burning the great forests uh, so that rain would come, uh, dynamiting the air, uh, and all sorts of other uh, ideas um, that were articulated also by the famous kind of American frontier slogan, the rain follows the plow. So the condition is most distinct the, the, the kind of the idea of climate change as a design project, the understanding that climate is the project of history, uh, is articulated uh, across what scientists and farmers would define as, as environmental thresholds, right? It's most distinct in places that separate arable land from desert and also of uh, rainforest from the kind of the agricultural frontier. Somehow uh, places that have too little water to become part of the uh, productive economy or too much that we cannot uh, enter into them. These are the areas that are actually acted upon. Uh, uh, the example, oh sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm actually changing slides on my own. <laughs> you haven't seen anything. <laughs> Let's continue like that without slides maybe. <laughs> So this, what you see here, is the, is the frontier of Italian colonization in Libya. Well, it doesn't move anyway. What? How does it work? Oh, yeah. OK, that's clear. Um, pushing uh, Mussolini's colonization of Italy, pushing the desert line into the Sahara, taking the Sahara about 30 kilometers to the south while displacing and murdering the Syrian Bedouins that inhabited uh, this area. So this and that. So the, the, the move was twofold. On the one hand, cartographers, and in this case, uh, Heinrich Kippert, um, travel to the Orient. One of the most important things that they want to mark is the threshold of the desert. And so that's the first step. What makes it? What, what, are, what are the conditions observable? or measurable, it will define the threshold of the desert, whereas the next project is to push the desert forward. And these two uh, are always um, entangled uh, moves somehow. And the reason is that um, at, the, at, the, at that period of the Ottoman Empire, 
it has not governed the desert. The desert has become, the defining of the threshold of the desert was defining the limit of the state, right? I mean, the state is where cereal cultivation could take place, wherever it would stop, usually under 200 millimeter rain per year, uh, cultivation uh, could not take place. Uh, in fact, if you look at that, um, those maps, the, again, the kind of the, uh, um, a map of, of these environmental uh, thresholds, and you see today where you know, forensic architecture has undertaken work on mapping drone strikes. When you put it on meteorological maps, it is still you can see that all drone strikes today take place along that line that was defined as the threshold of the desert. But here, of course, the opposite line, uh, here in a work uh, that um, has been introduced to Princeton now um, to, to the group that Eduardo Cadava, Paolo Tavares, and I are, are, uh, are working on conflict shoreline on the threshold of the tropics, right? So these are two, in a sense, equators Um, two equators that are at um, one that seeks to push the desert, make the desert bloom, and the other to deforest um, the, the rainforest, which are the frontiers of climate change. Cir thresholds that circles the planet, political equators of sorts, if to use Teddy's term, um, and all along them um, are situation of, of conflict, displacement, um, Etc. So when, when one speaks about, uh, I think, a truth commission in relation to um, environmental issues, one needs to speak about transformations that are much more, one needs to kind of to go far deeper into colonial history. Guatemala was mentioned, and this is a set of evidence that um, forensic architecture, Paolo and I are presenting also now in a trial that would start um, at the beginning of next year. The deforestation of the, um, of the um, uh, Ishil Maya areas in the Western Highlands of, of Guatemala is part and parcel of, uh, of the entire kind of development of the bringing of the state into that area. The state expands into areas that were um, uh, previously uncultivated. We just came back actually here. This is the, uh, another uh, of this arson fires, arson fire in, um, in, uh, in Brazil, where some of those villages uh, were overgrown by, uh, by forest. Sorry, I need to mediate between those two. Yeah. So back to the, back to the logic of uh, the Truth Commission. Um, in, it, it has emerged out of a failure of a legal case um, that was resting very much, and it's, it's, uh, it's almost inconceivable to, to imagine, on, uh, in which colonial accounts of the, of the Negev desert were presented as evidence against Be a Bedouin tribe um, that was uh, claiming its land uh, in the desert, um, and in which the history of Arab uh, existence in the Negev was, re was read as, a, as, a, as an opposite to that story of climate change as kind of the expansion of arable land. And um, the assumption that the Arabs have in fact uh, neglected, desertified, right? That the Arab, the Arab occupation uh, of, um, in that particular, starting in the 10th century, in that particular incident, has actually led to the de 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 desertification. The Arabs are not the sons of the desert, but rather uh, the fathers of the desert. Uh, that book was uh, uh, Henry Palmer's book, uh, a book that Said makes quite, uh, has quite fun with in Orientalism, uh, was presented, in fact, as evidence uh, in the Israeli court uh, for the fact that Bedouin never existed in the desert. Uh, he says, to call him, he, he talks about the Bedouin, the son of the desert is a misdemeanor. Half the desert owes its existence to him, and many a fertile plain from which he has driven its useful and industrial, uh, industrious inhabitants become in his hand like the South Country. I, the Arab occupation is in itself uh, a process of climate change. 
Um, what we were doing is actually tracking using the kind of the, the, the old uh, Palmer's book, going to the desert, trying to find exactly where he, where he went, where he was, and comparing that against um, meteorological data that we had um, at the time uh, from Ottoman records. Um, for example, you could see that rather than describing, if you read, um, if you read that literature for traces, for clues of the climate, of the history of the climate, uh, you see that in fact Palmer was going, he was not describing a desert, he was describing a drought. He says, um, well, you would see, he's actually walking on dry reeds that were plants before. And in fact, the, particular, the, the year that he spent in the desert, uh, 1968, uh, was one of the biggest uh, drought year uh, on record uh, that began in the, in the 1850s. Um, so here is where um, the, um, the Truth Commission is going to be put in relation to that community that is really on the frontier of that attempt to make the desert bloom. You would see signs of planting all around this uh, Bedouin community who um, return again and again to the cemetery uh, from which they were displaced, but the cemeteries are like anchors of Palestinian return. In fact, one of the only examples of, uh, of, uh, uh, of return that is actually articulated, and that map, again, that is articulated against them. Because that village is where the red dot is, because under it is nominally, legally, desert, under 200 millimeter per annum. Uh, supposedly, they cannot cultivate that area. They could never have cultivated this area. And because of that, uh, they would be displaced. All the line, this 200 millimeter line, operates like a knife. Uh, be, uh, underneath it is there is no private property because um, their supposedly cultivation uh, is impossible. So that village has rebuilt itself and has been uh, displaced and destroyed 80 times uh, in the last count. Uh, and the Truth Commission that is going to be built there in a series of tents uh, built by the uh, Alturis is likely going to be uh, the, the 81st time that it is displaced. And this is why we do it on New Year's, just to give us a few more hours um, uh, to operate. So these are, uh, you could see how um, displacement from, from kind of more, where, where the white dots are, uh, are Bedouin communities were displaced into the deeper desert um, throughout uh, the years of, uh, of the State of Israel and, and the, the ongoing displacement here captured in those uh, photographs, beautiful aerial <coughs> photographs by Fazal Sheikh um, that are uh, showing how the, the, the kind of the plantation of trees and uh, and uh, and um, uh, fields uh, are kind of replacing that um, uh, these things, the, the 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 Bedouin communities. So the main contention is what we are dealing with here is an environmental crime and. To, to seek to make a truth commission that includes environmental history and opens up into the long duration. Environmental history is always a long history. And, and that is a kind of, so, so that truth commission, which is not a state commission in any way, it is citizen organized, it is uh, uh, organized by the community itself, uh, is that, um, uh, is to ask what does it mean uh, to, to, to assemble a truth commission in relation uh, to the environment. Um, so you cannot really, it, it's not enough at, at a time where the court case has been lost, it is not enough simply to provide evidence, but to build again the conditions in which truth can be articulated, to ask what is truth, why oral testimonies were discarded, why indigenous um, uh, accounts and, and text were not uh, actually uh, used. So I think that in, 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 this, um, in this instance, uh, in kind of in thinking about, um, and I, 
I, I have a bit more, but I need to finish, I know, and I will. Um, that, that if we can, we can start understanding climate change not only as the collateral history, but also as a project, the response to the collateral is always minimization, it's always mitigation, calculation, etc. But a response to a project and a project of colonialism is to ask what does it mean to decolonize the climate? Thank you. Discuss. Um, in order to allow you all to ask a few questions, I just really want to add one question to the mix here, and, 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 and you know, of course, give people the opportunity also to react to one another's uh, presentations. Uh, which, which is to say, it's it's, a, it's kind of the obvious one uh, in the context in which we are convening, uh, which which has to do with the, as it were, the unit or uh, of politics, the the, the unit. Uh, of, uh, of governmental um, authority, of, of indeed truth, uh, in, in some register, vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the uh, scale question. So, so in other words, going down the line, um, you know, a, a professional body and its various iterations inter intersecting, in Daniel's case, with a variety of basically post-colonial uh, re-territorializations. In, in Deborah's case, the, the empire uh, as the political unit that needs to imagine itself and uses climate to do so and in the process uh, produces this, this object. Uh, in, in Greg's case, again, I'm you know, sorry for generalizing, but uh, the, uh, the, the, this sort of the networks uh, of sovereignty, uh, weak and strong, uh, state and corporate, uh, and so on, uh, and uh, in, in the, the, the sort of uh, imperial, post-imperial, neo-imperial, et cetera, and, and of course, again, in AL's, uh, both uh, sovereignties and regimes of truth, uh, commissions and otherwise, uh, overlapping or, and or uh, contesting uh, these spaces. So, I mean, if, if as it were, what the, the subtext of Paris is that the, the sovereign unit, the nation state, is also our best bet, uh, or maybe our only bet <laughs> in this case. Uh, there's a, this adds a practical, you know, this kind of question adds, a, as it were, a, um, a strategic, let's say, a dimension uh, to, to the otherwise historiographical and uh, maybe even theoretical considerations that, that might underpin uh, the, the category the, or the problem, uh, the conceptual problem. Uh, of, of the unit of politics, which of course is an old problem for political theory. Uh, so so I, I essentially want to ask all of you to articulate uh, the, the historical processes and or the uh, spatial uh, geographic ones uh, that you've been describing with this question in relation to the question of the, um, the scale, as it were, uh, of political process and, and agency. Oh, you can't see it? Okay. They can't see us. Can, can, can we turn on the lights a little? This is usually okay. You can't see it? There we are. Oh, no. It's okay? Hi. Okay. I'll leave it to you. Who wants to start? Hey, whoever, you know, I, I'm not going to, you know. Yeah, I, who would like I, I, I would, uh, sorry. Go ahead. No, Please. no, you go. No. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, it's, in terms of the political unit, it's, 
it's an important question. And, and you know, in the, in the context of environmental history, I think we've actually put way too much emphasis on the state um, as an actor, and, and particularly in the 20th century, it's, you know, no unit has done more to remake the world than multinational corporations, right? And, and yet, we, we don't really look, there's not a lot of work um, that's been done in looking at how much throughout the 20th century they've you know, remade the world, you know, in cooperation with the state. Um, but also the ways in which that cooperation has led to both uh, weak claims of sovereignty and, and, and strong claims of sovereignty. And so like in the case of Warberia, where you have a very weak state, right? Part of that weak state has always, you know, for much of the 20th century has been the, the strong presence of Firestone that has used its relationships to the state of the U.S. to keep that state weak. Right, so in the 1930s, you know, there's letters from Firestone to the State Department saying, you know, if you don't send a gunboat to protect our interests, we're going to topple the Liberian government. I mean, that blatant, right? And so, I think we really need to look at a diverse set of actors in terms of governance than 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 just the state. Um, Sure. So I think the 19th century is interesting because of the multiplicity of state forms um, and the variety of scales on which those political units existed. Um, so that, as you know, I was saying, of course, you need to do your scale analysis to do atmospheric science. You need to analyze which forces operate on any scale of observation. Same for history. Same for politics. Right? You need that kind of flexibility in order to. Um, identify the scale on which to act politically. And that was an advantage of the multinational state because administration existed at these multiple levels. And I've actually kind of shown how that worked out in addressing climate change. Um, yeah, you need to have And there are legacies, yeah. in fact, yeah. in the EU. Yeah, yeah. Right. BP. Uh, right, Legos. indeed. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I mean, and I with, would. With Brice Soleil. With Brice Soleil, precisely. And, and I think I would sort of. I don't know, uh, shift the question a little relative to, to almost a kind of discipl disciplinary politics or sites of agency, right. and, and uh, which is to say the question of technique, right? And so much of the, the discussion of uh, environmental uh, strategies in architecture then, then meaning every other time uh, and also now, um, uh, focused around this question of technique and, and, and insist again on these sort of questions of material and immaterial uh, sort of methods and how we can see this question of containing climate, relating to climate as absorbed both in the sort of material conditions of energy efficiency, again, in the sort of immaterial conditions of culture and discourse. And so that, you know, how these sort of technique becomes a kind of site of agency for both of these plays, ways to both, for both of those aspects to play out. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll let Ariel yeah. jump in and then do this, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, I mean, in this um, history, the state is, the wheat, right, and yeah. is the kind of the, the cereal cultivation line as it is moved. It's 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 by no means the kind of the uh, the agency that you know through which politics should be organized. In fact, what is interesting about this thinking about those environmental thresholds is that they combine the fate of people along its entire length, right? I mean, the when when the line moves. Everybody is underwater. When it goes up, you you dry, right? So the struggle is 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 really a kind of a, a, a connection. Um, is it, a kind of a polity that needs to kind of to operate along that um, that idea. If the problem is articulated as on the scale of the globe, it is both simultaneously a local struggle in each one of the points along that line, and it needs to, solidarity need to be built along it. And in fact, um, in, in that line, in, across you know, the entire Middle East or the, um, uh, south, the, the Sahel in, in Africa, there are struggling communities who are you know, on that frontier of climate change, like those that are you know, sharing the same fate in the, in the Amazon with those in DRC and Papua New Guinea, etc. So that is, so the kind of the question of scale is, you know, you need to, to, to really be able to somehow act under and over the scale of the state. And then politics should not be organized within those artificial borders that have been imposed. 
I, I would want you to, I mean, we're going to start gathering questions, but to take up Greg's challenge in a sense to think states and corporations as overlapping and intersecting sovereignties in these cases. So I, I don't know, like in the case of Guatemala, what would be the forensics of the corporate, of the coffee and the, all the rest of it, uh, the, of the corporate transformation, of of, and how might that interact, or does it interact? Of course. Because yeah, at right. some level, we're, all talk, we're also talking about, in a sense, competing regimes of truth. Mm -hmm. As the example of ExxonMobil and Columbia University just demonstrated, um, corporations are also regimes of truth. Uh, and not necessarily aligned with the forms of truth that can be contested in this or, or not in, in the state. Um, but anyway, I mean, this is no doubt to going to percolate, and hopefully what we're doing this morning is to lay out a few terms that will, you know, continue to, to develop through the rest of the day. To do that, we'll, we'll um, invite questions. We will keep talking if you don't have questions, but I know this. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the title is The Scales of Environment, and we are promoting that uh, at the local level, you know, residents put solar panels and take care of their waste and all these things. And then on the other hand, we see uh, cases like what's happening in Montreal right now, and the dumping of, uh, you know, the sewage in the uh, uh, Lawrence River. Uh, we see that in Lebanon, um, there is a huge problem with waste, and they're dumping that all in the Mediterranean. Um, so how do you put all these international, local things and really still convince, you know, the, the, the person that is making an effort to bring solar panels in their homes to make a difference? Um, is that, is that is solar panels? Solar panels. Uh, I, mean, yeah, I mean, in some ways your question is, seems to be, and I don't mean this in a, in a sort of, you know, in any way dismissive, but that things are kind of screwed up anyway. Right, no matter how well we design these buildings or how much energy efficiency uh, one can infuse into a performative method, you know, at this stage, it's kind of a done deal, right? And there's a certain amount of uh, large-scale effects that are, that are going on that are, that are quite difficult to imagine uh, the specific detailing of a recycled or unapproved, you know, piece of wood in your 200-story apartment building going up in downtown Manhattan, right? Um, uh, so I think there's some, you know, the sort of question of scale of uh, the, the, the local and the particular that, that leads to a certain amount of recognition that these scalar effects are already in play, right? And I think part of what's at stake in that relative to the solar panel or to the various forms of technological devices is again less about the potential uh, efficiency of that device, but more about what other sort of social collectives can begin to be gathered, you know, sort of around these questions and how these material and immaterial aspects can, can uh, work in some sort of dynamic relationship, right? So, you know, I don't think that, that this kind of effects one does at the personal scale are necessarily so that they will aggregate effectively into a larger scale, but rather sort of forms of social transformation that might end up, you know, meaning something completely different after the seas rise and the, you know, rain falls, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, there's a question here. Hi. Um, uh, such an uh, amazing experience coming to uh, Columbia here and then to see the slides about uh, Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew and, uh, you know, takes you back to your classes. You know, we used to have in third year the climatology class and Otto Coins, Coinsberger's here? books. Did you, did you here? Not here, yeah, yeah, but, but uh, back in India. In India. And, uh, uh, you know, that's how, like, uh, we got familiarized with uh, the climate right. and the environment. Uh, and then hearing about the epidemics and the Ebola, and uh, uh, what, what, in terms of scales, what I always wondered that we never really got an education or as a professional, we never ever make a, a sh in our sheets, uh, we never make something which is for waste management or garbage. You know, like if I have a large proje project uh, which is at a scale of a campus or a monastery or something, I may put a location for a dumpster, but you know, in overall, all our system, we don't have that. Right. Yeah. And which is directly connected to what goes to our groundwater and to rivers and to the ocean. We 
need a class in waste management, yeah. Do, do you want to, I don't know. No, we need a, yeah. That's, is there a question or is that, that's maybe more an observation, yeah. my question is, yeah. You know the uh, the connection between we you know something which is the climatology to yeah. the larger ecosystem. Yeah. Well, waste, right? Around the question of waste, which is right. Fair enough. I don't know. Well, Does public health, I think, what? too. Health. Is yeah, yeah. Does anybody want to? Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I think you know this gets back to kind of. Um, you know, disciplinary board boundaries and walls. Yes. It's like why, you know, <laughs> what's the relationship between the School of Architecture here and the Maryland School of Public Health, right? right. right? Um, you know, and, and thinking about, you know, infrastructure in, different, in a different way. Um, so. yeah. Well put. Yeah. Uh, Mike, Mike? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank, thank you, Reinhold, for putting together this panel on history um, in terms of scale. I'm wondering um, why the scale was so sh so tiny. So what? Tiny. Tiny. If the Earth is 46 billion years old, oh, we're yeah. just talking about okay, 200 I'm years. Yeah, time. Time. <laughs> but it, forget about that. I, I am going to follow from the end because um, I, I do uh, uh, like the idea of decolonizing the climate. But perhaps the climate uh, is the one by itself that decolonizes. Because it seems to me that the uh, ecological disaster actually weakens the nation state and also weakens the corporation. And I wonder if, if, if that is not uh, the other way around, you know, instead of decolonizing the climate, the climate is already decolonizing the world. In, in more specific question, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I was interested in this uh, a very um, <laughs> closely knitted paper on the uh, Habsburg Empire. And in, the, in that case, I was fascinated by the jump at the end to uh, Husserl's phenomenology. I could not see what one thing had to do with the other. But um, I, I do think that there you have the idea of mapping and the production of scientific knowledge uh, as a way to create a state identity, very much uh, to, as a kind of truth commission, but without any reference to the uh, important work done earlier on by uh, somebody very important from Germany, uh, Alexander von Humboldt, and his, uh, his explorations in 1800. And uh, I think you cannot look at the uh, applications of these uh, techniques without going back towards that. And also, I would like to know what the hell uh, the f uh, idea of phenomenology, which is published in 1906 in, in uh, Freiburg, has to do with what your paper was about. Okay. All right. Well, but Thank you. We have three minutes. You have three minutes to speak about deep history, phenomenology, <laughs> and Humboldt. I, I, just very briefly to the last two. So Humboldt, uh, sorry, Husserl, as I mentioned, was a Habsburg subject, right? Um, and his critique of the sciences, as I said, echoes the self-critique that the Habsburg scientists themselves had. Humboldt, in fact, learned his methods of plant geography from a Bohemian naturalist in the late 18th century. I'm not, you know, dismissing his contributions, but the Habsburg role needs to be written in there too. The Habsburg Empire, you know, beginning there, in the 18th, we're talking about the 18th century, right? I, I can't hear. I don't know. Um, well, it's okay. okay. Keep going. Go, 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 go. Do you, you want to say? I mean, maybe just to, to, to add the question about the scales of history, writing deep sure, history, sure. and so on. That's the beginning of your, because that's I think worth elaborating quickly if we can. Right. I mean, so this is another kind of advantage of the Habsburg state is that um, its um, institutions stretch continuously um, from the early 16th century. And the late 19th century scientists are very self-conscious about the historical legacy and the legacy of environmental knowledge that is contained within those institutions. So my project actually um, it's not about a billion years, but it is about several centuries. 
Uh, yeah, just very fast. Like in relation to uh, climate change, the dec climate decolonize. I think it's it's interesting because if you have the kind of the colonial project just there, grammatically kind of pushing, making the desert bloom. Now there's a counterforce that kind of desertify pushes it on the other side from the other from the opposite direction. Of course. Uh, in, in, in our region, the Bedouins are kind of caught in between that two lines, but it, there is a process by which the, the, um, the, the field line, the agricultural line, has been pushed away, if you like to call it decolonization, I don't know. But I, I, I think that something that is important if you think the notion of historical truth in, in relation to Truth Commission is that when you bring in political history and environmental history together, it's not only the kind of the long durée that you need to bring in, it is also a kind of a predictive and projective history. Um, I, it kind of, thinking as a historian in relation to climate puts you kind of in the middle of time. You can look forward and backward simultaneously. And, and this is really, um, you know, to be at the threshold of the desert and look forward and backwards is a, is, is a condition in which kind of complicates the very political and historical task of, uh, of political claims um, in, in relation to environment. Okay, well, what do you want to say? Oh, I was Go just going to say briefly relative to this question of deep history that, that you know, I think one of the things that's uh, compelling about some of these questions of uh, environment and climate in particular as we examine the history of architecture is, I mean, just this sort of recognition. Were we to have a, uh, some sort of a timeline that would show the rise of fossil fuel use, of course, this is precisely parallel to the sort of elaboration of the traditions of modern architecture that we all have come to sort of know and love in various forms. And so I think there's a sort of challenge to the discipline on the terms of, you know, I mean, like, what does it mean that Mies van der Rohe's Seagram building is sort of rated the lowest possible energy uh, efficiency out there, right? And, and, and how does that sort of present or sort of con present encounters or sort of confrontations to our field to sort of rethink how we look at histories and evaluate them and think through uh, the sort of monuments and patterns and, and notions that will persist? Okay, time has ended. Please stop okay. <laughs> to, to future histories. Okay, thank you.